Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. This is Victoria English. I'm the head coach at Alcohol Free Lifestyle. I'm excited for this episode. I'm in. I'm interviewing a Project 90 graduate, a man who went through our 90 day program and achieved that night that very important 90 day uh, mark, and decided to move on into beyond 90 to get to really, really see what life is like on the other side of alcohol. Jeremy Wilson is joining me today. Jeremy is 41 years old. He is from Indiana, now lives in California. He's a financial controller and a father, husband who loves the outdoors, loves being with his family. And Jeremy has been an outstanding member of our community. You know, our community is curated. This is not, that's why there's not a click here to join. We work with a specific type of individual, someone who is holding it together on the outside. Things look all right, even though it can sometimes feel like that pulling a thread on a sweater and there's some fraying. They have a great mindset for success. They're driven, goal-oriented. But there's another thing that we are looking for when we meet people on these discovery calls. And that is, are they coachable? Is this highly successful person able to come in with a mindset of curiosity? Let's see what's possible here. Are they able to say to themselves, wow, I know a lot about a lot of things. However, my attempts to live alcohol free and feel free haven't worked out in my favor. Jeremy is one of the most coachable members I've had in a while. And so today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Jeremy's journey and what made Project 90 so successful. Jeremy was alcohol-free for over three years. He did it on his own. So this is about a lone wolf becoming coachable. Jeremy, thanks for joining us. Yes. Yeah, good to be here. Before we get started, uh, you guys, Jeremy is also a musician. And I'm going to look him up on YouTube later. His former band is called Calafia. He's a huge fish band fan. So for any of you fish fans out there, I know that is a, a whole lifestyle movement thing. So if you're one of those, Jeremy's one of you. One of you. Uh, so yes, he's got a really interesting story. Jeremy, let's start with... Uh, start at the beginning, talk a little bit about, you know, what prompted you to become alcohol free for three and a half years? Yeah, well, I think the the big thing was um, the, the pendulum had swung from what I viewed alcohol as being more of a net positive uh, effect on my life to definitely going down the, mm. the road of being a, a net negative. And um, I have to give credit to my wife through a lot of this. Um, uh, she was the, uh, the impetus and, and a lot of the encouragement um, when I made that, that choice uh, for the first time to, to, to really give it up. And um, you know, my two young boys too, it's like, having a family and, and having all of that responsibility and needing to be a good example for them and, and be the husband and, and father that I needed to be. Um, I think that was the the kick in the pants that finally got me to lock in and, and really commit that first time. Um, and like you referred to uh, earlier, that was, that was really me just kind of filling my head with as much knowledge as I could and reading what I could and, um, you know, connecting with, with groups online and kind of reading what had been successful for them and getting encouragement that way. Um, but, 
but as you said, I, I, I really was on my own. It's not like I had a support group that I was checking in with daily or anything like that. So, um, so yeah, I was able to sustain that for a while. And then, you know, I think is it's a fairly common story thought, well, maybe I can introduce mm. this back into my life and have it be different this right, time. And right. unfortunately, so not. what I'm hearing you say is you, you educated yourself. Uh, I understand that you read books like This Naked Mind by Annie Grace. She is the one who actually certified me. So shout out to Annie. And was it uh, Quit Alcohol the Easy Way? Things like that. Alan Carr. Yeah. yeah Alan and Carr. So, and, and that's cool because I, I did the same thing, actually. I would listen to all these podcasts and everything. And I knew a lot. And it, it was helpful. What I lacked was the ability to really, really integrate it and make it part of who I am. Would you say that was a similar experience for you? I think so, because throughout those, well, I, I, should, I should back up one step. So I, I think part of the, well, I shouldn't say I think, I know that part of my, my initial journey down this road, we had just moved. So I lived in California for 12 years and we had just moved to Seattle. Um, and that was a big upheaval, leaving, leaving this place that I loved and, um, and, and moving to a new place with my family. Now there was, you know, my wife's side of the family here, um, as support, but I, that, that whole move and the stress around it is what really sent me to what I would say was my low point that I then said, okay, I gotta, I gotta do something about this. And, um, and, and, and be better. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I, I was able, I think to integrate that stuff, let's say 90 to 95% of the way, but as time went on and I wasn't feeling my, I wasn't reminding myself of those things and I was successfully living my life and things were better than they had ever had, than they ever had been. I started to have the feeling that I'm doing this more for other people then I'm actually doing it for myself. I'm doing this because this is what is expected of me um, versus this is what I actually want to be doing. And which means to me now, the way I see it is I still was obviously assigning some value to alcohol, thinking that it was going to improve my life in some way that adding it back in responsibly uh, would make my life even better. And so, so yeah, I think that Maybe, maybe those teachings and those lessons were fully integrated at first, but just little by little without any accountability or sticking with it, they started to slip mm -hmm. away and the old temptations and desires started to creep back in um, to the point where, you know, it was a very, it was a very thoughtful reintroduction into my life. It was something I talked to my wife about. We actually talked mm -hmm. to her therapist about the best way to go about it. And, sure. um, you know, and it was fine for a few weeks, but then kind of slowly. And then all at once I was, I was back where I had been mm -hmm. and not living the yes. life I wanted to live. So, <clears throat> you know, when, when we stop drinking, uh, it is so important to, to understand our, our why. And like you, I also would stop for other people. And I still had that cognitive dissonance. I know that I, I know that I should be living this alcohol free life and Alcohol still holds value. I still view it as something that I would really like to have in my life. And that sets up that that that's not a great setup for sustainable success. It might work for for a period of time. Um, but still seen as something that holds value ultimately means that we have a sense of living in deprivation. And humans are pleasure-seeking mm -hmm. creatures. Living in deprivation brings up some feelings, and eventually it's likely they were going to scratch the itch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. Um, you know, I, I think that that, like I said, that perfectly describes the point I got to, you know, probably, mm -hmm. probably three years into that, that span where, yeah, it did, it did seem like, uh, okay, I've, I've got control of this and it, it can be an additive mm -hmm. thing in my life again. 
Right. What have you learned? Uh, we, we focus a lot on the science, as you know. What have you learned about that, about why when you went back within a matter of weeks, you were at the same point you'd been before you ever stopped? I think one of the most, one of the most impactful lessons I learned in this program, I've, I've referenced it a few times, and I, I don't remember exactly which call it was or, or how it got in my head, but it's one of those things that stuck there, and, it, and I still think about it. And that was how we, like, I mean, all of us are obviously genetically differently, but there are some of us, and I, I have a perfect example with my wife, some of us who alcohol affects serotonin receptors more. And so she's very capable of having one or one or two drinks. And even the second one, sometimes just saying, ah, I don't want any more of this. I'm kind of starting to feel a little bit sleepy. Whereas for me, uh, the reintroduction of it just immediately, it was like, stomping the gas on that that flood of dopamine again um and so i think like just very rationally scientifically that's the way that i would describe it you know it's that's what's going to happen based on the way that i am if i have that in my life it's the classic Mm -hmm. one is too many and ten is not enough and i think i fit that profile um and that was nothing or that lesson uh, is not something that I had ever really learned before. Um, despite understanding, okay, you know, obviously alcohol does affect the brain this way and it, and it does these things, but just that juxtaposition of, of two different kinds of people. And I was able to relate that to something earlier in my life, uh, gosh, like 17 years ago. Now I found out that I had, um, I was having some stomach problems and I went to, doctor. And he's like, well, why don't you give up gluten for a while and see if you feel better? So I did. And I almost immediately felt better. And so that was an easy association to make. Now it was, it wasn't an easy thing to give up, especially then because it was very hard to go out or go to the grocery and find things that were gluten-free. Now it's much easier. And um, it's kind of weird, the, the similarities between giving up alcohol and that, because with that lesson, I was able to make the connection in my mind. This is just something that's not good for me much like this other thing I removed from my life and felt better. Um, and much like gluten, it's interesting that it seems like, uh, and maybe it's just because my eyes are open to it, but I'm noticing more and more people are going this way and there's more and more alcohol-free alternatives available. Um, shoot, there's even a, a, a like a gluten-free, alcohol-free that. beer that Athletic Brewing Company makes that, that I see everywhere. So, uh, so yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know. It's like I'm evolving into the way that the world yeah, has gone. I get that. Like that. I, yeah. I also, uh, went gluten-free, uh, close to two years ago after all my chemotherapy and everything, mm-hmm. my gut has never been the same. And so I have, I don't know if it's celiac, but I've got autoimmune stuff. So it walks like a duck. It talks like a duck. And so gluten was making me miserable. And it was funny, Jeremy, I, I went through some of the same stages that I went through with alcohol. I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll just have a little bit of gluten. I'll only have gluten at a birthday party. I'll only have gluten when I go to a really great Italian restaurant. And I caught myself And I thought, oh my gosh, Victoria, you're doing all the rationalization and everything because gluten held value to me because it tasted so good. And then I got to the point like you described where even a little bit made me so miserable that the fear of living a gluten-free life uh, was less scary than the idea of continuing to eat gluten and just suffer. So isn't it funny how our minds work? And here's a question for you. And we, we've talked about this on calls as well. When someone gives up gluten or gives up dairy, there's no, there's no real emotion attached to it. And it certainly doesn't create any kind of uh, angst in a social situation. You might not be able to eat as many things. I certainly go and look at buffets sometimes and go, well, that would be nice. Uh, But no one's coming up to you, Jeremy, and saying, oh, man, you're going to eat gluten with me on my birthday, aren't you? 
I mean, what about the class reunion? You're going to have, you're going to have gluten there, right? So isn't it funny how the emotion and the stigma ties into it, even though, like you said, when you look at it scientifically, it's just how we are wired. We, you and I don't tolerate gluten and we don't tolerate alcohol very well. It does bad things for us. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Although I would take it in a slightly different direction and it could be because when I first stopped with the gluten, it wasn't as much of a thing. Like you definitely didn't see a gluten-free section in the grocery store, or, you know, items noted that on the menu. Um, it, it felt to me at that time, like there almost was a stigma around it. Like I was, I was different. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like <laughs> weird from, from the way that most people are. And so in a way you're right. It's not, it's not like someone is pressuring you to have a piece of birthday cake at a birthday party, but inside there, there's a similar feeling of I'm different from this other group that's enjoying this thing. And I don't like the way that that, feels, that is interesting. You know? I hadn't thought of it that way. Because you're right, people. I I had peop, I had a few friends who gave up gluten, and I thought, oh, you're you're being kind of a pick me, you know, <laughs> like oh, there's the gluten free person. <laughs> yeah. So you're right; it has evolved uh, that that gluten free lifestyle because more and more people are are just noticing that. Wow, I I just don't feel that great. And, uh, so you were, once again, you were a trailblazer in, in that, in, in that field. Yeah. And I am glad we have a lot of gluten-free options now and look at how the alcohol movement has followed suit. It, do you find that it is becoming more, just more normalized to choose something besides alcohol? It seems that way, uh, to me. And I don't know if it, it, probably part of that is attributable to um, that effect of once you notice something, you notice more of it. Um, but I, I, I think uh, it, I, I definitely am more aware of those options. And, and, it, and, and people in my age demographic, particularly, um, I notice are either giving up drinking entirely or drinking less and less. Um, you know, I think of people in my, in my family, I think of folks who are in my friend circle. Um, we had a gathering at our house on Friday night and it wasn't like there was some big announcement that, that there wasn't going to be drinking, but I think there were two folks at the gathering who drank a little bit of wine, but the rest of us didn't. And there was no discussion about it. That was just the way that it was. Um, so yeah, uh, and you know, maybe part of that's attributable to what I'm doing and the influence maybe I have because I used to be I used to be the one pouring gas on the fire and not doing that anymore. Um, but uh, but yeah, and I and I hope I really hope to continue to attract more of those kind of friends and acquaintances, like James said in one of the earliest some of those early videos in the P90 um, journey. Y you just by choosing to do this and doing it genuinely. Um, and confidently you're, it, it, it's just going to, so it's going to happen that more of those folks are going to come into your life. Um, and you're going to, you're going to be a part Absolutely. of more of those kind of events. Yes, that, that does happen. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, cause we do, we do start to attract like-minded individuals. I think that when folks come into project 90 and meet people, even though we're not meeting in person, they feel connected. It's not just, oh, you drank too much too. You, you are, a lot of us are cut from a similar cloth and that feels safe and comfortable and liberating. So it only makes sense that we would then attract that in, in the real world, the world outside of our, of our time together. Mm hmm. So you went back, didn't go as planned, and you said, "All righty, let me do something else." So he, so the lone wolf starts seeking solutions, and 
You mentioned this is a full circle moment to be a guest on the podcast. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so I think it was, if, if, if my memory serves, um, it was sometime in March where, and I, I remember I woke up and of course didn't feel good because I'd been drinking the night before. And, um, I was, I should mention too, I don't, I don't know how many folks this applies to, but I was being dishonest about it. I was, I was hiding drinking because I was trying to pretend like I was living one way, I was actually living another way. And so that was a whole other layer of, you know, disgust and shame with myself, not being truthful with, mm -hmm. uh, with my wife in particular. So anyway, I'm, I'm laying there in bed on a Saturday or Sunday morning with all these feelings and, I just thought, okay, I got to, I, I got to find some kind of support group. I got to find, I got to start filling my head with, with the good knowledge and the good messages again. And I opened up the podcast app on my phone and I just typed in alcohol free. And, you know, those are the first two words of the podcast. And so it was the first one that came up. Um, I hadn't heard of it before, but there was, I had heard James's name and it, it may have been because I'm a big sports fan and he was, you know, sports center anchor, but somewhere I had seen it, it seemed familiar. I was like, oh, the, you know, I'm aware of this guy. And so, um, listened to a few episodes that, you know, I just scrolled through and looked at the subjects of the, the episodes. Um, and it really, it, it really landed with me because of the way that, that James and the whole program approaches this lifestyle of its, it's an additive thing. It's not a subtraction thing. It's, um, it's, a it's a, it's a confident way to live. There's no stigma around what was going on. There's no, you know, I I'm defective and this thing has control over me. Um, it was just a very empowering, uh, new approach to, um, to dealing with it. So, um, so I saved the, I saved the podcast and I would listen to a few here and there. I didn't make the decision right away. Um, but everything came to a head. Uh, I think it was in late, mid to late April, um, you know, made, made what in hindsight were some stupid decisions, but at the time seemed like the only decisions I could make because I was not operating at full capacity. And it really came down to the point where uh, it's like, I, I, I can't believe this, but my marriage is in trouble. My wife doesn't trust me. What do I have to lose here? Um, I've got to do something different and I, and I need to do something to show her that I'm not just trying the same old things again. Um, and that's when I went on the website and took the questionnaire and signed up for an intro call. And, uh, my wife and I both were actually on the call with Adam, uh, when we, when we talked about really getting in the program and, um, just took the leap that day with, with her and his encouragement and, you know, really Amazing. haven't looked back. That, that really, that really shows your true ca character. Alcohol takes us out of integrity with ourselves. And then that spills over into our mm -hmm. relationships. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, you and your wife, this was a, you, you attempting moderation was, was a, a joint decision. It's not like you just decided one day watching a game that, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to have a drink. It was a thoughtful conversation you consulted with a therapist. And I can only imagine what it must have felt like when you knew that that you were going down a slippery slope. And how do you tell her? Yeah. yeah. Well, and it was there was a lot of shame around it too, which I don't feel now, but but then I did because I was so confident and I got this and, you know, I can do it and I'm, I'm stronger than this thing. And now I realized that that was mm. the wrong way to look at it altogether. Um, but yeah, I felt really defeated uh, and really down yes. with all of yes. it for a while there. Not, not truly understanding the science and, and how, how the wiring is there. It's, we don't change our, pathways we build new pathways and so you being alcohol free was great your life got better but were you really building a life of your design a life that you really really felt like you were filling your cup and uh so yeah it makes sense and then and then you find yourself on that slippery slope after feeling like this was a, a team effort and then uh-oh here i am 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I remember conversations I had had with her and, and with others just saying, Hey, I realize where it had gotten to before and l- look at all I've gained in these three years, you know, career wise, health wise, um, mm-hmm. just goal wise and no way I'm going to let that happen again. And so when it did, it was just like, I, I, I didn't know. I I couldn't process it's it. Lot. You know, it's it, a was, lot to it was very on. difficult. Yes. I, I've been there more than, more than a yeah. few times. Like, wait, what the heck? How do I get back down here? It's like the game of shoots and ladders. You know, you're going up, you're climbing the ladders. And then all of a sudden you're whoop, down at the bottom. You're going, hold on a second. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Well, yeah. Jeremy, I'm glad that you heard our podcast and that you joined us. I love that your wife was on the call with Adam. Uh, Adam is one of our enrollers, great guy. And that you, again, made this a team effort. I think that's that's wonderful. So you came in and I remember when you did and you were definitely ready. You were ready to do this. And uh, like I said, you were extremely coachable. So I have looked into what, what is, what does it mean to be coachable? And I think this describes you. The definition of coachable is one is ready to do what it takes to change, transform, improve, or excel, whatever that means for them in their situation. So that was that was you. Yeah. You came in, you had, uh, you're confident in lots of areas of your life. You realized you were lacking some, some, some skills and some tactics in this one. You came in with a really, really open mind. Uh, as you know, with your onboarding call, you were told about the, what we, what, what's on our side of the commitment and what we ask of you on your side meaning coaching calls, Marco Polos, and the most important part, opening up and being very honest and vulnerable. Can you describe a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, I think, so I, as, you were, as you were setting that up, I was kind of thinking back, what was it, what is it about me that, um, that makes me, coachable in this way. And I, and I think your definition was perfect, just really ready, ready to accept advice and, and expertise um, in order to get to uh, a more desirable place. Um, so I, I'll, I'll take, I'll use my career as an example. I never intended to do what I'm doing. And we could, maybe we want to talk more about this later too, but I'm actually going to do something else. But anyway, to get to the point I've gotten to, I didn't, I didn't really study this in school. I kind of fell into it. And so from the outset, I had to listen to people who were smarter than I was and had more experience than me. And that's, I think more than anything, that's what's made me successful both in life and in my career is being able to reach out to folks who knew, know better and take their advice, apply it to myself, kind of distill it down to its, to its core core parts and use that to kind of like get up to the next handhold. Um, and so that's, that's been very similar here. And so, uh, you know, starting out, I thought, okay, well, the zoom coaching calls, that makes total sense. I'm into that. You know, I can get on a meeting and participate and listen and take notes. Um, the, uh, I feel like one of the other, uh, one of the other, uh, uh, legs of the stool of this program is the daily 20 gratitude every day. That made sense to me. It's like working out a muscle. Um, but then there was this Marco Polo thing where the, the guidance was basically, Hey, get on there. I think it's four times a week and share how you're feeling. Don't just talk about the weather or how your favorite team is doing, but really talk about yourself and what you're going through and encourage others. And I'm like, I'm allergic to social media and the look at me here's Mm -hmm. look at all these pictures of my family and here's how great I am. Um, And so that was hard for me to lean into, uh, but it didn't take very long of doing it. And again, back to your point, it was like, I paid this money. You guys told me to do it. So this is what I'm going to (laughs) do. It's been, it's worked for others. Um, And very quickly uh, with, with the guidance of others, you know, who are farther along in the 90 days than I was, 
um, who kind of showed the way and set a, set an example of how to do it. Um, it just started to get easier and easier to get on there and, and listen to how folks were doing, respond to them, share challenges in my own life. And really having that pod, that community on those polos was such a larger part of this for me than I ever would have dreamed that it was. And don't get me wrong, but I, I mean, I learned things on the calls that, that I referenced earlier that have been monumental in, 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 in this perspective shift. But, um, yeah, that group of people that, that was, that was constant, but always evolving as new folks came in and older folks, you know, folks who had been in the program longer left was just, it was that daily, every morning I fired it up and checked in. It was like checking in, checking in with my favorite baseball team in a way every day. How, how's everybody doing, you know? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I don't know. That's kind of a rambling way, but to answer the question, but hopefully that answers it the question. It absolutely you asked. answers the question. Uh, I think yeah. it really illustrates a few things. You know, first of all, uh, yes, many of us feel that feel that way about social media. We're so tired of curated content and uh, you know these snapshots that people post and pretend that that's the, the whole story. Uh, there's definitely a lot of fatigue around that, and. I like to think of, of Marco Polo as the antithesis of social media. And so, you know, we, it is a come as you are. In fact, if I see someone who is getting all fixed up and curating their content, that's a sign for me to reach out and poke the bear a little bit and say, let's talk about what's really going on. Your hair looks great and it doesn't matter here um, to the point. Maybe you've seen it where I'll post a polo, you know, I'm a mess, no makeup or anything. And I'm like, Hey, this is, this is life. We're all human. I want to know how you are really. And there's such a genuine caring in our community around, around that. Because like you said, you, you wake up and you fire up the Marco Polos because you really do want to see how everyone's doing. Yeah. And it's, it's gotten to a point with me. I don't know if this is just, I've, I've got a little bit of a perfectionist nature, but um, once I, once I got into the pod and really got into it a few days into the program, it didn't matter. There were times where I had no reception. I was like off in the woods and I'd missed three or four days and I'd get back and it's like, this is what I'm doing on my commute until I catch up. I got to see every one of these. And I'm the same way in Beyond 90 now. If I miss a few days, I don't just jump in. I'm like, I want to know how these folks are doing because there's, there's like, there's, there's nuggets of, of, of knowledge and experience and a place to maybe jump in and share something that's been helpful to me in every single, uh, every single one of those. And I, I don't want to miss it. such a great other. attitude. So, you do. You, 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 you want, you really want to enjoy the entire experience of life on the other side of alcohol. And, and yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's funny because again, we, we do work with, with successful people and not a single one of them got there without mentors, inspiration, Right. Uh, oh, continuing to grow and hone their skills and expand their skill sets, things like that. We just finished the Olympics and, you know, these these people train. Constantly, they're always striving to hone and improve and they have coaches. So when you look at those sorts of individuals, you can certainly say, what can I learn from their mindset? And I'm so glad that you came into this alcohol-free journey with that same, same attitude. And because uh, it is different when it's alcohol, there can be some, some feelings, some, some shame, like, oh, how do I get all the way down here? Now I got to pay money and show up and talk to these strangers. And, but if you're open and curious, that's where the magic is. And that's, that's what you've been and continue to be in beyond 90. Yeah. yeah. What are, <laughs> we'll talk about two more things. First, uh, what, 
what are some of the greatest benefits that you experienced within those first 90 days? Um, I think, well, the number one greatest benefit is removing, and I don't want to say a hundred percent because it's all, I, I think it's, there's always going to be an aspect of it that's a work in progress, but removing value from alcohol. And so I went to uh, a concert last night with my family. It was great. Went and saw Sierra Farrell um, at the, the Woodland Park Zoo. And, you know, it wasn't like a big, big party kind of concert, folk music. Um, but that would, that would have been an environment where, uh, let's say two years ago, if I was there, I would have felt like I was missing out on something by not, by not being on the, on the, the, the blanket drinking. And last night there was no part of me that had any temptation of, I, Oh, I could stop here and get something. Nobody would know. Um, just not a desire. And so, so alcohol losing all value in my life, let's say has been the number one thing. Um, and without that, I don't, I think that's like the cornerstone of it. You you cannot assign any value to this thing. Otherwise there's always going to be that voice in your head saying, okay, how could we fit this in? How might this work? Um, from that, uh, one of the things that, um, that I've re-realized uh, is just fe not feeling fantastic every day because everybody sleeps bad every now and then, or we get sick, but by and large, feeling physically and mentally like the best version of myself. Um, and so that's, to me, that's like another building block of, I would never want to sacrifice the way that I feel physically and some of the things that I'm achieving now and the hobbies and, and activities that I love to do. Um, I would not want to sacrifice the mental clarity that I, that I could, that I notice um, that's hugely different from how it was three months ago. So I think those those three things, the, the, the value being gone from that substance. Um, I should mention too, just improvement in relationships, uh, particularly within my immediate family, um, uh, would be a huge one too. But, but so relationships, physical health, mental health, and, um, just truly seeing, seeing how life is better and, you know, every aspect without, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> dumping poison mm -hmm. <laughs> down my throat on a regular basis. Um, and I think even seeing alcohol that way, you know, James has the attractively packaged poison. Uh, uh, he should trademark that or copyright it. But it, it's true. It's, it's a great way of looking at that substance. That's that's what it is. Um, and so uh, seeing it for what it is, is indeed, you know, it's a game indeed. changer. Yeah. From the from the moment we wake up, it, whether we've had a great night of sleep or, or, or a restless night uh, to wake up. And not even before we open our eyes, not have that holy cow, what did I do? To me, that's priceless. And that's that's before we open our eyes. How how much what is that alone worth? Waking up in the morning knowing that you're not in trouble with your wife. If you are, it's about something little. You didn't take out the the garbage or whatever. You're not in trouble with your wife. You've not lied. You're not hiding things. Less irritable with your children. I know you, we follow some of your adventures. You're very active with your family. You love the outdoors. Mm -hmm. It's invaluable. Yeah. Yeah, and all that's improved. I mean, I just, I think back to, a, a vacation we went on a few weeks ago. Um, there's, there's nothing about that uh, in hindsight that, that would have been any better doing it any other way. And uh, it's just, just continuing to stack those blocks. And um, as we alluded to earlier, I mean, I, I come at this a little different because I, I sort of know, I, I know this to be true, but, but going through it this time with this mindset and um, just, it's like the first time you do anything without that substance and you realize actually it's, it's the thing I'm doing. That's great. Not, not the substance. It's just oh, for sure. reinforcing those new pathways. Yes, going right? to a concert. I remember going to a concert and 
not drinking and, and I love live music. And I thought, wow, I, I'm alert and aware of every single song. I don't have to keep leaving to use the restroom because I'm not guzzling this stuff. <laughs> that makes me have to go. Uh, I'm not waiting in line at the bar and missing, potentially missing the song while I'm in line waiting for my drink. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, you get to really just enjoy the, the, the whole reason that we, that, we, that, we, that we do these things, which is for pleasure. Yeah. So you you yeah. graduated with flying colors, as as I said. Uh, you're going to be a, a reference for me when when you're on those B ninety weekend calls and things like that. Because when when you had your celebration call and and people asked you know what worked for you, you said I I kind of did what they told me to do, and it really worked out the way it was meant to. So, you know, you weren't resisting. So that's going to help a lot of people. And I hope it, I I know it's going to help some of our listeners. And um, so you, you continued on to Beyond 90, which is our program that takes, takes our members to one year alcohol free. It is not as alcohol centric, right? We're not, we're not, not usually a heartbeat away from picking up a drink Nervous systems have begun to heal. Prefrontal cortex is is rebuilding itself. Uh, You're thinking more clearly. Relationships are getting better. And it's really about, okay, Jeremy, you now, you're a songwriter. You now get to write the song. Alcohol is no longer the composer. What are you excited about over these next nine months? Um, I think, well, the number one thing I'm excited about is just continuing to be uh, the husband and father that that my wife and kids deserve. I mean, that's number one, always number one. Um, An extension of that being the, you know, the son, the cousin, the the son-in-law, all of that the friend, uh, being the best version of myself for, for, for the people in my life, my community. Um, beyond that, uh, I referenced this earlier. I'm really excited for what I'm going to do and what I'm looking at as the, the second half of my career. Um, and you know, I was, I was fortunate enough to, to do what I did for the first half of my career that now allows me to go in a different direction. And, I've always had my, my parents were both teachers and I've always had this idea in my head that that's something I'd really like to do, but it never seemed like it would be possible. I wasn't sure that the support would be there. I wasn't sure it was something, you know, candidly that financially I could, I could swing. Um, but the more I've learned, the more I've researched, the more I've talked to folks, uh, and the more that, that, you know, my family's life has evolved to this point, it just, it, it, my wife and I were out for our, uh, uh, anniversary dinner and we were talking about it and, and she said, why don't you, why don't you take this leap and just go do it? Um, cause quite frankly, it's a total first world problem, but I'm just not, I'm not excited about what I'm, what I'm doing day to day anymore. And so, so I'm excited to continue in that direction to go back to school and, and get the degree that I need to go teach what I want. I'm completely changing what I'm doing. I'm not doing finance and accounting anymore. I'm going to go teach science to high schoolers. That's what I've always wanted to do. Uh, and so I, I can't wait to dive into that and, and get, get more involved in my community and, and, and all of that that way. And, uh, you know, a huge aspect of that too, uh, is taking it back to family again the way I grew up, I, I treasure those experiences I had with my mom and dad and my brother uh, during Christmas break, during spring break, during summer break, when we would travel and spend time together and, and go on all these adventures that really helped shape me into the person that I am today. And to be able to create the space to do that with my own boys um, and give them some of those same kind of experiences uh, is it's what I'm looking forward to more than anything else. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that sums it up. I've, I've got other milestones that I'm looking at that I know are possible now that wouldn't have been before. I want to be a single handicap golfer. And over this summer, I've gone from, I think 
started out at 17 or 18 and I'm down to 14. That has all that has to do with is approaching the game the right way and being present and feeling good physically. Um, so, so stuff like that. I just, everything has kind of a, a brighter, more possible hue to it now than it did before. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, well that's a lot, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. I'm looking forward to. Uh, it's, well, it, it really is a, a great example of, of what Beyond 90 is. It's, it's a lot and it's possible. You know, it's, it's definitely stretching and you can totally do it. I think that once we topple the yeah. big domino of alcohol and we don't, again, we're not just not drinking. We're living in a life that feels free from alcohol instead of it nagging at us. Not again, not to say that it doesn't pop up or whatever. It's, you know, it's not an overnight thing, but just, uh, it's amazing what that does for our confidence. And, uh, you are new to beyond 90, but I'm sure you're already seeing the, the, the crazy things that people take on, they change careers. They learn to fly, they scuba dive, they volunteer in other parts of the world. It's fantastic, isn't it? Exciting to watch. It is for sure, and uh, I, I mean, I'll give a plug. I, I'm at the very start of of, of B90, but um, the uh, the the intro call or kind of the the introductory call that were last week orientation. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was time perfect because I just came into the program. But uh, I was thinking, this is <laughs> this is beyond what my expectations were pardon the pun. Um, but I think it's, uh, that's going to be perfect as I navigate these changes I have out in front of me to really be thinking about things the right way, really set goals and get after them in the right way, be accountable to that group that's there. Um, and I, I feel lucky, you know, we, we were joking before we started recording about me being maybe a little bit on the younger side of this program, but I look at that as a as a bonus too, because I get to gain the experience from folks who are more advanced in their careers and have more experience in life than I have, and so I look forward to to their guidance and examples Very as I exciting. I work through all these yeah. things as well. Yeah, it is it is beyond it's 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 fun to be part of a pack, and I would say that you the lone wolf has found his pack, and we're so glad that that you're part of it. <laughs> Uh, well, listeners, I I will bring Jeremy back when he hits one year so that we can follow up and see what kind of magic has happened in his life by his own creation with, with the support of the coaches and, and the invaluable community. I think that'll, that'll be fun. Maybe I'll, ha I'll have to call you Mr. Wilson and, and give you a shiny apple for your desk. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there'll be there'll be paper wads <laughs> being thrown at my head on this next call. It won't be just a it won't be just a sterile that sounds office like so this. So fun and exciting. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeremy. For our listeners, maybe maybe this is the episode. Maybe this is the one that resonates. Uh, as Jeremy mentioned, he came to us through the podcast, and maybe you will too. You can book that discovery call. It's fifteen minutes. It's free, and it's a conversation. We might be the fit for you. Maybe we aren't. We can share other resources. The, the important thing is to break that inertia, to take that step forward. And as I mentioned with Jeremy, just be curious what might be possible. Might be with us, might not, but pick up that phone and make that call. Could be a turning point. Thank you, Jeremy. And thanks for listening. Until next time, take good care. Have an awesome day.